from Hollywood, the NBC Theater presents... Screen Director's Assignment, Production, It's a Wonderful Life, Director Frank Capra, Star Jimmy Stewart... The Hollywood screen directors present a flight of fancy into time that never was. It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart, and introducing the director of the film, Frank Capra. motion picture audience, there can be only one measure of a truly great director. His name, by itself, must be a badge of excellence upon the screen. Such is the name of our guest screen director tonight, for it has become a synonym for unforgettable motion picture entertainment. The NBC Theater is proud to present the distinguished director of such brilliant films as It Happened One Night, Lost Horizon, You Can't Take It With You, and tonight's story, It's a Wonderful Life. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Frank Capra. Thank you. The story of It's a Wonderful Life became a motion picture by a rather roundabout way. It started out as a simple message of goodwill, a brief fantasy printed on Christmas cards to be exchanged between friends. It was a fine story, warm and human and and exciting in a very unusual way. We felt that it had something, something that perhaps could be shared by everyone. That's why we made the picture. And now tonight we hope to share it with you again as a radio play. It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart in his original role of George Bailey. Your Supreme Excellency, I, Clarence Oddbody... Angel of the second class, to make application for promotion to Angel of the first class for services as follows. On Christmas Eve of 1948, one George Bailey of Bedford Falls was on the point of committing suicide, an act abhorrent both to his maker and to the Hemisphere Federation Mutual Life Insurance Company. (laughs) Feeling in exceedingly low spirits, George Bailey did go, proceed, and travel to the high level bridge where he mounted the rail. Before George Bailey could weep into the icy current, I, Clarence Oddbody, did hurl, project, and fling myself past the great Magellanic cloud through the constellation Lyra into the Earth's atmosphere and the Bedford River, executing, if I do say so myself, a perfect swan dive. I can't swim. Help! Relax. Now don't struggle. Help! I'm coming in after you. Help! Here I come. It's a good thing this old toll house on the bridge was unlocked. Yeah. Well, we can both dry off in here without freezing. Yeah. Yeah. How'd you happen to fall into the river? I didn't fall in. Huh? Well, I knew if you thought I was drowning, you'd jump in to save me. So I jumped in. You jumped in? To save you. You see, you didn't go through with it. Go through with what? Suicide. How'd you know I was going to... Hey. Hey, who are you? I'm an angel. A what? An angel. Clarence Oddbody, AS2. (laughs) AS2, what's the AS2? Angel second quest. Oh, I see. (laughs) What are you, crazy? Well, I'll confess I've been rather distracted for the past few centuries due to my failure to acquire my first-class wings. But crazy? Uh Uh-uh. If I do a good job on you, I'll get my wings. Brother, you haven't even got your buttons. (laughs) Why don't you tell me your troubles? No, you're balmy, that's why. Well, then humor me. Do you good to talk. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's about all I have left in life. 
Let's talk about it. Well, talk. Oh, I was going to knock him dead, I was. I was going to shake the dust of this crummy little town off my feet, and I was going to see the world, build things, do things, travel the Taj Mahal and Silken Samarkand and the moon pools of the east and Everest and the deep Aegean. Yeah, pipe dreams. Why? Well, my deaf ear, for one thing. Oh, that was when Howie, your kid brother, fell through the ice back in 1919. I jumped in to save him. I... Hey, wh- how'd you know that? I wed it in the Gabriel Dewey Trumpet. <laughs> well, anyway, I got an ear infection. It was weeks before I could go back running errands at the Gower Drugstore. So what does Gower do? He hits me in my bad ear. Why? Well, he just heard about his son. He died in college from typhoid. Gower had been drinking. I wouldn't deliver some medicine for Mrs. Blaine's little girl because the bottle he took it out of was marked poison. Dear, dear. Well, Doc Gower smacked my bad ear, and I guess I cried. But I finally made him understand his mistake. Um, was Doc Gower grateful? Well, he cried. Ah, Eleven years later, he bought me a fine set of pigskin luggage to take on my world trip. Oh, then you did go away. There was a girl in town named Mary. We'd grown up together, and she was engaged to Sam Wainwright. I had an hour or so before train time, and I stopped over at Mary's house. Well, George, just think. After all these years, and... All your planning and saving and wishing. You're going to realize your great ambition. This is the most exciting day of my life, Mary. I'll... We'll... We'll miss you terribly in Bedford Falls. Well, I'll only be away a year. You'll write, won't you? I'll send you a golden apple from the Garden of the East for your wedding present. Thanks. I'll make golden apple sauce out of it. What's the matter? Why... Would I say something wrong? Hey... Hey, hey, the doorbell's ringing. I know the doorbell's ringing. Don't you sneak away, George Bailey. I want to talk to you. Mary, I'm looking for George. Uncle Billy, what brings you over here to Mary's? <laughs> George, your father's just had a bad stroke. Oh, no. Dad, what is he? Uh, no, but I don't think you'd better start on your trip, George. Not just now, anyhow. Well, go on, George. Well, Dad was gone that same night. That gave old man Potter his chance. Old man Potter? Yeah, richest man in town, a banker, a big stockholder in our loan company. We'd always fought Potter on a lot of issues, and now he wanted the loan company to dissolve so he could rule the roost in Bedford Falls. Potter and I had it out a week after Father died, right in the boardroom alone. Just a minute there, Potter. Now, just hold on here, just a minute. I admit that in the 25 years since Father and Uncle Billy here started this loan company, we didn't make any money. I admit that. But who gave the low-income people in this town decent homes to live in, huh? You did? Yes, Mr. Potter, we did. Who built Bailey Park of model dwellings where you wanted to put poor cemetery? You did. That's right, we did. We gave this town those things. We gave Bedford Falls and its now, citizens... That's the trouble with you, Baileys. You gave everything. No wonder you never made any money. What's galling you, Potter? Is Mr. You... Potter to you, oh, Bailey. My nephew is Mr. Bailey to you, Potter. Your nephew is wet behind the ears, you mindless fool. Oh, say that again. Say that again. Just keep out of this, Uncle Billy. I'll handle Potter. Mr. Potter to Stripling. What's eating you is that you can't gain control of this loan company, Mr. Potter. Hmm. It's up to this board to decide what to do about the company now that Father's gone, but if I can do anything to help keep Bailey Park a reality and to keep Potter from making people crawl to him when they need help, just count me in, gentlemen. Count me in. Now, as a result of that speech, the board voted to continue the loan company. If I'd remain as vice president. Goodbye, trip around the world, huh? Yeah. yeah. At least until brother Harry came home from college to take over for me. 
Only Harry came home with a wife. Well, that's co-education for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but did his wife's father have to give Harry a big job out of town? Oh, I see. Leaving you holding the bag with the loan company. Yeah, yeah. Hey, what? what's that music? That's a church hymn. Old Hundred. Seems to me Mary sang it that day long ago. Remember? In the church choir. After church, you walked Mary home. Remember, George? Remember? Come in for a minute, George. Well, just for a minute, Mary. Here, let me take your hat and coat. Mary! Who sat down there with you? It's George Bailey, Mother. What's he want? Well, I don't know. What do you want, George? Me? Uh, well, not a thing. I just came in to get warm. He's making violent love to me, Mother. Well, tell him to stop. It's Sunday. <laughs> hey, hey, now, look here, Mary. I didn't come here to... to what did to, you come here for? Well, I, I just walked you home, that's all. Lots of girls ogling you at church. Why pick on me? Well, now, listen, Mary, I... Why I, don't you go home? Well, I will. Thanks. Where's my hat? You got it on. Thanks. You're entirely welcome. Goodbye. Deaf in one ear and blind in both eyes. That's you, George Bailey. Now what's the matter? You ought to see a specialist. You can't even tell when a girl... When the girl you've walked to school with all your life... Oh, go see a big eye, ear, nose, and throat man. Why, Mary. Hey. Hey, Mary. Hey, let's go and see a specialist together. Reverend McAllister, big hymn, sermon, and wedding ceremony man, huh? <laughs> And so you were married, huh, George? Yeah, I had about $2,000 saved, and it looked like, well, it looked like a fine chance to combine that world trip with a honeymoon. But? A little thing called the Great Depression. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was a run on the loan company started by some false rumors of potters. At the last minute, Mary threw in the $2,000. It was just enough to reassure our investors, and we didn't have to close up. And you didn't have a honeymoon, either. No, no. No, but Potter was licked again. So when he called me into his office one day, I was just about the most surprised man at Bedford Fall. Well, I want to tell you, George Millard, that during the Depression, you and I have been about the only ones kept our heads in this town. Thanks, Mr. Potter. Uh, all that talent, and where does it get you? 28 and 29... Married, <laughs> making forty dollars a week. Forty-five. Uh, and you're the smartest young fellow in town. All right, all right. Now, what's your point, Mister Potter? I want to hire you. You, you want to hire me? Manage my affairs, run my properties. Twenty thousand a year. Dollars? And two months vacation with pay before you start work. <laughs> Take yourself a little jaunt around the world first, eh? The Vale of Kashmir And the moon pools of the east And the deep Aegean And the whispering aurora Well, George Well, but what about the loan company? What about it? We'll dissolve it Oh, no Oh, no I don't want your dirty job What? You sit here and you think the whole world revolves around you and your money Well, it doesn't You're out of your mind I won't let you buy me away from the people who depend on me Robbie And I've made my decision, Potter And may it stick in your craw to regret as long as you live, George Bailey May it stick in your fool craw <laughs> You are listening to the Hollywood Screen Director's presentation of It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart with Arthur Q. Bryan as the angel and introducing the director of the film, Frank Capra. George. 
George, after your marriage to Mary Chase and your very spunky rejection of Potter's offer to manage his affairs, what happened? How'd it go? Oh, I stuck it out a few more years with the loan company, then the war. Doc Gower and Uncle Billy sold war bonds. And Harry, oh, my kid brother Harry, shot down two Jap suicide planes just as they were about to crash on a transport full of U.S. troops. Well, what about you? Oh, it's 4F. The bad ear? Well, it just wasn't in the books for me to get out of Bedford Falls, that's all. Well, it brings us to tonight, Christmas Eve. What made you want to jump off the bridge into the river? I can give it to you the fast. The bank examiner came to check our books, and we were $8,000 short. Next question. Where did the $8,000 go? Well, if I knew, I wouldn't be here on the bridge, would I? No, no. All I know is that I sent Uncle Billy to deposit $8,000 to our account over at Potter's Bank. Uncle Billy talked to Potter for a while in Potter's office, and then he went over to the teller's window to deposit the money, only it was gone. Well, where? How do I know where? I was almost insane. I questioned Uncle Billy half the night trying to locate that missing $8,000, but it was no use. Please, George, please don't ask me any more questions. I can't think anymore. You've got to think anymore, you stupid, fumbling fool. I've got to have that money. Do you realize what this means to us? It means bankruptcy and scandal and shame and prison. Now, one of us is going to jail for this, but it's not going to be me. I've had enough of being the fall guy for this crummy little town. You can just deal me out of this one. I've given up my years and my ambition for the people of this town, and all I've got is frustration and disappointment. And I've had just about as much as I can swallow. It's sticking in my craw, just like Potter said it was. Well, maybe Potter would lend you $8,000. Potter? Maybe. Potter? Well, yeah, well, it's our only chance. Well, what about all your fine friends you've done so much for, George? Why don't they lend you the money, hmm? Well, they don't have that kind of money, Mr. Potter. You know that. Now, please help me. Yeah. Well, what kind of security do you have? Any stocks? No, sir. Bonds? No, sir. Real estate collateral of any kind? Well, I've got a $15,000 life insurance policy. What's its loan value? $500. $500. Look at you. You were going out and licked the world once. What are you now? You're a miserable clerk crawling in here on your hands and knees and begging for help. Five hundred dollars. You're worth more dead than alive. Oh, that's very true. Uh, so you want me to help you, eh? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to swear out a warrant for your arrest. Arrest? Misappropriation of funds. Arrest, but Mr. Potter... Merry Christmas, George. And so, because you were worth $500 a wife and $15,000 dead... You thought killing yourself would make everybody happier? Yeah, better still, I should never have been born. What's that? What's that you said? I said I wish I'd never been born. That's what I thought you said. George, they've granted your wish. And maybe I've got the scheme to win me my wings. Angel, first class. What wish? George... You've never been born. Oh, stop it, will you? You're talking like an idiot. Am I, George? Let's see. Excuse me, man. Got a match? Who are you? Come in, Doc. Come in. Got a match, anybody? Hey. Hey, you, you're Doc Gower, the druggist. I was Doc Gower, the druggist. Until I poisoned a little girl by mistake. Oh, no, now, wait a minute, Doc. Been drunk ever since. Now, Doc, don't you remember? I discovered your mistake, and I warned you just in time. Do... Oh, you. Well, don't you remember me? I'm little George Bailey. I ran errands for you. Uh, nobody named George Bailey ever worked for me. Match? Here you are, Mr. Gower. Hmm. 
Now, all I need is a cigar. Here you are, Mr. Gower. Oblige. God rest you, merry gentlemen. I love you, Mr. Oh, wait a minute, Doc. Let him go, George. Let him go. That... That broken old derelict, Doc Gower. Well, you weren't born, George, so you couldn't prevent that broken old derelict. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, I... Hey, I'm going home. Home? What home? You never lived. Oh, shut up now. Cut it out. You're crazy. Let's see if I am. We'll go to your home. Ride the bleak wind, George Bailey. Let's see where you live. Let's see. I tell you, this boarding house can't be my mother's house. Knock again. Oh, this broken down old shack, my mother's house? Knock again, George Bailey. All right, but I... But... There's no vacancy. Mother. What are you uh, talking about? Mother, mother, please help me. There's something terrible that's happened to me. I don't, just keep me here until I get over it, please. I never saw you before in my life. Don't take in strangers unless somebody I know sent them. Uncle Billy sent me your brother. You knew him. Well, of course I know him. I, I saw him just today. That's a lie. He died in the insane asylum after old man Potter took over the loan company. Why do you lie to me? Mother, mother, please. Good night. Yes, mother. mother. Come on, George. We've other places to go. Why are we in the public library on Christmas Eve? Some people work late if they're lonely and have no Christmas to go home to. Like that pinched-looking woman at that desk there. Mary. Yes? Mary. The library's closed, you know. Mary, you're my wife. You must be quite out of your senses. Now, look at me. Look at me, Mary. I'm George. I'm your husband. We're married. I never married. Man I'd marry never was born, if you must know. I hate them. Mary, now look at me. I'm George Bailey. You're Mrs. George Bailey. I'll call the police. Mary, you must listen to me. Hello. Please, Mary. Hello. Mary, listen to Give me. Give me the police and hurry. It's very dark on this road. Yes. And cold. Stop here. Where are we? Potter's Field. You mean Bailey Park? I mean the poor cemetery. You mean my low-cost home development? Look where you stand. Gravestones. Here dwell in final squalor and humility the nameless, the vagrant, the very poor, the disinherited. You put them here. I tell you, no, I built Bailey Park on this ground. Read that tilting gravestone at your feet. Read. In memory of our beloved son, Harry Bailey, 1911, 1919. This isn't true. Harry's alive today. He went to war. He shot down two planes that saved the lives of every man on that transport. Your brother Harry broke through the ice at the age of nine. It's a lie. He saved the life of every man on that transport. Every man on that transport died. No. You killed those men on that troop no. ship. You wished it so. I didn't. You. Please. You. No. Yes. Harry wasn't there to save those men because you weren't there to save Harry. You wished it so. Yes. Forgive me, Clarence. You see, George, you'd have lived a pretty wonderful life if you'd only been born a strong and useful life. I know now. I know that no man is an island unto himself. I know now that our lives are wo woven inseparably one to another. I know that life bestowed by the Almighty is for no man to reject. Then my work is done. Wait, Clarence. Help me. Help me get back. 
I want to live again. I'm glad I was born. I want to live again. When you hear the musical chimes, I will have won my wings. Guardian angel, first class. Send me back, Clarence. Send me back to life again. Live, George Bailey. Send me back. Live. Thank you, God. Live. Thank you. Live. George! Live. George! Uh, what? Oh, Mary. Oh, George, darling. Mary, how'd you know I was here? Oh, I was so afraid for you. I, I thought of the bridge, too. I'm sorry, Mary. Oh, please come Live. home. We've been looking for you. Looking for who? The whole town. Everyone in Bedford Falls that you ever helped. And that's everybody. I know, but there's $8,000 missing from the loan company. They know that. And they've taken up a collection to help you for all you've done for them. There's more than $8,000 under the Christmas tree. No. Cash, money, orders, and checks. No. Yes. Well, hallelujah. Merry Christmas, George. Hey. Hey, Mary. Hey, listen. I didn't hear anything. When, when you hear the musical chimes... What chimes? Atta boy, Clarence. Atta boy. Our guests will return in just a moment. Next week, the NBC Theater brings you another outstanding motion picture story to the microphone as we present the romantic drama, Hold Back the Dawn, and our star will be Charles Boyer. And now, here again is tonight's star, Jimmy Stewart, and screen director, Frank Capra. Say, uh, Frank, do you mind if I ask you a professional question? Not at all, Jimmy. Uh, how, do you, how do you turn out so many wonderful pictures? What's, what's the secret, anyway? You really want to know? Yeah, I really do. Clarence. Huh? Clarence, the angel. What do you... <laughs> well, you mean the character in the story? Oh, sure, he's been around for years. Stands behind my right shoulder and tells me what to do when I'm in trouble. He practically directs all my pictures. Uh-huh. Uh, Clarence, huh? On a movie set... Yeah, well, it was a little difficult at first. Yeah, I can imagine. He didn't have a screen director's guild card. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell me, Frank, uh, if Clarence was so smart, how come we had to shoot the last scene of It's a Wonderful Life five times? Oh, All that. Time? Well, you see, Jimmy, yeah. that... Uh... Hey, Kappa, better quit while you're even. Say goodnight. Let's get out of here. Okay, Clarence. <laughs> see how he keeps me out of trouble? Good night, everyone. Good night, folks. And good night to you, Jimmy Stewart and Frank Kappa. <laughs> It's a Wonderful Life is presented to the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, whose current release is Bride of Vengeance, starring Paulette Goddard, John Lund, and McDonald Carey. Jimmy Stewart can currently be seen in the Metro-Golden-Mayer production, The Stratton Story. Frank Capra is currently producing and directing the Paramount picture Riding High, starring Bing Crosby. Included in tonight's cast were Arthur Q. Bryan, Joseph Granby, Hans Conried, Irene Tedrow, Georgia Backus, Herb Butterfield, and Barbara Eiler. It's a Wonderful Life was adapted for radio by Milton Geiger, and original music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. Production was under the supervision of Howard Wiley, associate producer Bill Karn. Your announcer has been Frank Barton. Listen again next week when the NBC Theater presents... Screen Director's Assignment, Production, Hold Back the Dawn, Director, Mitchell Lyson, Star, Charles Boyer... <laughs> The NBC Theater came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.